Following coordinates transmitted by Weyland Yutani, Russ Jordan and his family trekked to the same derelict spacecraft visited by the Nostromo's crew 57 years prior. Russ Jordan's hope, of course, was to gain a percentage of the rights claimed by Weyland Yutani for whatever findings were discovered. It was Russ's belief that whatever this was, it was a big find, and the Jordan family would be set up for life, even if the majority of the profits went to the company. Russ and Ann Jordan went to investigate further, leaving their children, Newt and Timothy, in their vehicle to wait. They were gone for what Newt could only describe as a really long time. And to her horror, Newt's father returned with an alien parasite attached to his face, which would eventually lead to the xenomorph infestation within Hadley's hope. So what exactly happened during Russ and Anne's investigation inside the derelict? Christopher Golden's novel, Alien, River of Pain, details events that occurred on the Acheron colony before Ripley and the team of Marines arrived. And it reveals some interesting findings from the Jordans. Excerpts from the novel describe the following. At first glance, the gargantuan object rising out of the ground looked almost organic, as if it were the huge curving remains of some giant alien beast. As the crawler slowly rolled nearer, he saw the shape did, indeed, have some organic influence in its design, and there could be no doubt that it had been designed. But not by humans. They'd never seen anything like the object's horseshoe shape, or its strange biomechanoid construction, but it most certainly was a vessel a starship. Judging from the way the rocky terrain had been torn up, leaving great piles of debris clustered around it, he sure felt it had crash-landed here, digging up the stone and ash as it scarred the ground on impact. They wore belts equipped with core samplers, flashlights, and short-range comms that would allow them to communicate without having to shout. Hefting cameras and testing equipment, he and his wife climbed down out of the vehicle and dropped to the surface. Clicking on his helmet light, Russ set off towards the derelict object, trudging through dust and then climbing onto a rocky ledge that protruded from the ash. Anne caught up to him as he studied the shape and the weird texture of the ship. Anne took the lead, trudging down from the jutting stone, through drifts of ash, and up a cascade of rocks beside the hull. They began by attempting to walk the entire periphery of the ship, but just a few minutes after they'd begun, Anne froze up ahead of him. She glanced in either direction along the broad, tall corridor. The floors and walls were made of some otherworldly alloy, tubes like veins running along the ceiling and the innermost wall. She switched off her helmet lamp to conserve its battery, gripped another light that was attached to her belt, and turned it on. Russ did the same. The tunnel would take them to the tip of the ship's horseshoe design, the one closest to the crawler, which suggested that more significant finds would be to the left in the bulk of the vessel. At this point, Anne suggested that they should leave, that they should call in what they've found up to this point, and take the kids back into town. If we go back, we'll never know what they really find out here, Russ said. Even our little cut of this find could set us up forever. Do you understand? But if we want to protect ourselves, keep the company from fucking us over, we've got to know what it is we've found. Anne considered her husband's objections. It stood to reason, and they had gone that far. She agreed to continue further on the terms that they would spend no more than half an hour inside, not wanting their children to be left waiting outside in the crawler any longer than necessary. They agreed and continued forth, and twisted around and saw the shadowy cleft in the wall. Holding her breath, she edged nearer, and in the light from her belt she could make out an opening that was much larger than she thought. Floor to ceiling, it curved into the wall, a wide swath of shadow. Ducking her head to the cleft, she froze. It spirals down, she said. Their version of stairs, Russ suggested. Maybe. Definitely goes to another level, though. The spiral reminded her of the inside of an abandoned seashell, which underlined for her the strange bio-organic feel of the ship, as well as the emptiness that haunted her. You sure we shouldn't have gone down here to check out the sublevel? she asked. Maybe, but I'm going to guess that whatever passes for a pilot's cabin is at the crux of the horseshoe. I could be wrong, but we don't have time to think too much about it. Whatever's down there, it'll be more than just corridors. As he spoke, the ship's inner darkness seemed to deepen. Anne turned her head and shone her light on the wall, revealing scars in the strange metal. She stopped again. Look at this, she said, staring at the pits and gashes in the wall. There were others on the floor, 
Something had melted right through, which made her stumble back and look up, around to make sure whatever had caused the melting hadn't continued to leak. As they continued, Anne fell behind him again, but she kept her eyes on the walls and floor now, and she saw numerous places where similar scarring had occurred. Not just the melted spots, either. There were scorched holes blown in the wall, as if some sort of weapon had been fired. If not for the obvious age of the vessel, the way the dust and rock had eroded its hull and begun to swallow it, she would have begun to worry. The corridor lit up with a sickly yellow illumination, and Anne gasped. The walls were different here. If the ship's construction seemed to hint at the organic, this was something else entirely. These walls were covered with a smooth, ribbed substance, black and gleaming, like some melange of insect cocoon and volcanic rock. When they came to another open cleft spiraling down to a sublevel, they stopped and stared at it for nearly a full minute. This cleft differed from the first. It, too, had been covered by the chitinous material, as if to adapt to a different sort of species altogether. Look, let's just make it to the crux of the ship, to see if that's the engine room or pilot's cabin or whatever. We'll take footage of it, and then we'll get the hell out of here. As long as we get that far, they can't shut us out entirely. Whatever might be of value to the company, artifacts, technology, whatever. If it's down here, and we pass it by, we'll regret it forever. We're talking crazy, Anne said. Abandoning the colony without a backup plan, with no exit strategy, that's foolish. But this? You're right. This could be it for us, the thing we've been searching for. The kids are out there waiting for us, and they'll keep waiting. We've left them longer than this, and they know how to entertain each other. It's for their sake that we can't leave here without knowing what we've found. Anne took one more long look along the corridor, her light gleaming on the strange ridges and curves of the glassy black walls. A flash of a connection sparked in her mind, cocoon to web to spider, and she shuddered at the inference. She didn't like the idea of them being trapped in some kind of spider web. Not a web, she thought, frowning as she studied the walls again. It's more like a hive, a wasp's nest. Either way, she didn't like it. Anne led the way into the cleft, and she and Russ followed the spiral down into the lower level of the derelict ship. Russ said nothing, but she could see from the way he held himself, the cock of his head and the slight hunch of his shoulders, that he felt the dark weight of the ship around him, just as she did. Her heart beat faster, and her breath turned shallow as they wound their way down, helmet lights throwing ghost shapes on the walls. They found the first dead thing, at the bottom of the spiral. Holy shit, Russ muttered. Anne held her breath as she stepped into the corridor, staring at the thing in the juttering beam. She was trembling. In life, the alien had been very tall and powerfully built, with an extended torso and a long head. It seemed humanoid, only in the sense that it had two arms and two legs, but otherwise it was entirely other. Something about it suggested an insect, which gave her an unnerving connection to her thoughts about the hard substance that coated the walls. And yet this was no bug. Its skin wasn't skin at all, but some kind of armored carapace. Richly blue in spots, it had faded to gray in most places, and the carapace looked to have gone thin and brittle. She felt sure the thicker, darker shell was closer to its living appearance. Its tail wound behind it, sharp and skeletal with a tip that would have made for a wicked weapon. Not quite a stinger, Anne thought, but if the alien used it that way, it would have killed a person just as quickly. It's beautiful, Russ said. Anne turned to stare at him in disgust. Look at it, he said. It's like nothing we've ever seen, until now. It's horrible, she said quietly, staring at the blue-tinted jaws and the tail. This thing was born to kill. It's been dead for a very long time, Russ said. But I'll tell you what it was born for. To make us rich. He gave a quiet laugh and turned away, moving down the sublevel corridor. Anne stared another moment at the dead alien, and then followed. Russ might be right, and she knew this thing couldn't harm her. Its cadaver was a little more than a shell, not unlike the derelict spacecraft that they were exploring. But she couldn't escape the feeling of its presence. 
Now every shadow felt full of menace, of teeth and slithering, sharp-tipped tails. The sublevel had been completely taken over by the chitinous walls that she'd seen above, but still there were many spots where something had melted through, sprayed and burned its way into the walls and floors. They walked through the darkness, lighting their own way, and at a curve in the hallway, they found three more of them. One had been torn in half, its desiccated corpse a dried and twisted thing, half on one side of the hall and half on the other. Another had an enormous hole through its midsection, and the floor beneath it had been melted away into a yawning chasm. A draft swept in from there, but whether from outside or somewhere within the ship, they could not tell. There were doors all along the corridor. Some of them opened easily, while others were stuck shut by that strange, hardened, resin-like substance. The first two that Russ opened contained nothing more than dust and small, strange bones. In the next, there were thick metal alloy shells with mounds that were now wrought. It was impossible to know what they had been before rotting. Cargo, do you think? Anne asked. Of some kind, Russ agreed for food or some other materials. Those first two rooms were pens, though, like stables, alien livestock, or something else. Whatever they were, these creatures were taking them somewhere. That didn't sound right to Anne. Didn't feel right. I don't think so, she said. Not the things we saw back there. What do you mean? Whatever those creatures were, they weren't the ones piloting this ship. He nodded, but didn't respond. They continued on, discovering other massive alien corpses in clusters of three or four, perhaps twenty in all. Several minutes later, maneuvering through the claustrophobic underbelly of the ship, they encountered something altogether different. New remains. Anne froze. Now she understood why the corridors were so high and so wide. They hadn't been built this side for the sake of grandeur, but simply for scale. The remains of this new creature were more humanoid than the first, but even larger than the others. Nine feet, and guessed. All that remained of its body was its skeleton. Bones inside some kind of exosuit of the same design as the ship, with the same techno-organic texture. This dead thing had been one of the ship's crew. She knew it. Where are the others? she asked. Others, Russ said. You think there are other species here? No. No, others like this one. Where's the rest of the crew? Russ had no answer. How long have we been gone from the crawler? She asked. Dunno, he said, checking his watch. Thirty-five minutes? Not more than that, I don't think. All right, let's get some images of this guy and the others, and then we get out of here. Five minutes more, she said. Russ agreed. They worked mostly in silence, both of them uneasy. Anne felt disappointed in herself, in both of them. By all rights, they ought to have been ecstatic. They had been right. This was going to change their lives. Their share of whatever the company made from the salvage, from the ship and its tech, from the alien corpses and whatever Wayland yutani might learn from them, meant that they would never have to work again. They should have been weeping with joy, screaming in celebration. Instead, Anne felt like she couldn't breathe, felt the weight of the air inside the ship as if it might suffocate her. She wanted out, and judging from his silence, she knew that Russ felt the same. It took them ten minutes. When they'd finished in the sublevel, they lugged their gear back up the spiral, then paused together and looked along the corridor toward the crux of the ship. Both of them. They had been married so long, knew each other so well, that no words were necessary for a decision to be made. This close, Russ said. Five minutes or less, and we'll be at the crux. See what there is to see. A few images, and we're back outside in fifteen, twenty minutes at most. The kids are probably napping by now. I'm sure it's been more than an hour, Anne told him, but Russ knew that wasn't an argument. They both glanced back the way they'd come, toward the breach in the hall that would be their exit, and then he hefted his gear onto one shoulder and took her hand. Together they walked toward the crux. Around the next corner, they discovered one of each of the two alien species, locked in a terrible embrace. This bug-like creature was different from its brethren. It was larger, and had a large, ridged plate on its bright blue head that seemed to be kind of a crest. What the hell happened here? 
Russ muttered. War, Anne said. The question is, where did the bugs come from? Were they on the ship, in the cargo hold? Or were they already here, on Acheron, and attacked the ship after the crash? And what about this one? Russ asked. Why is it so different? Anne studied the deadly embrace again, studied that blue crest, and frowned. It's a queen. What? You mean like with bees? Doesn't this all remind you of a hive? She gestured at the crusted walls. Maybe the others are like the drones, and this one is like a queen. She shrugged. Or maybe that crest on its head just makes me think of a crown. The alien she thought of as a queen had impaled the crewman with its tail, but the crewman had given as good as he'd gotten. He'd thrust his arm up inside the queen's jaws, as if he had tried to destroy its brain with a bare hand. Come on, Russ said. Let's finish this up. I don't want to be here anymore. They walked on. Minutes later, they found a vast chamber, where many of the crew must have once been able to gather. The dome curved high overhead, and it was crusted with the same chitin that they had seen elsewhere. This is just creepy as hell, Russ said. I feel like I can't breathe. Anne could only nod. There was a platform at the front of the chamber. On it stood a massive seat and some kind of giant apparatus that she felt for sure must have been used to navigate the ship. In the seat was another of the crew, though this one wore a helmet that covered its entire head. The pilot, do you think? Russ asked as they climbed up to investigate. Or the navigator. Look at its chest, Russ whispered, and she could practically feel his breath at her ear. But Anne had already seen the twisted, mummified bones jutting out of its exosuit, and the hole behind its ribs. That's how they killed him, Russ said. Must have used a weapon, or maybe one of their tails, like in the corridor back there. I don't think so, Anne whispered. She'd seen the way the bones twisted outward. Whatever had killed the giant had come from inside. She stumbled back from it, nearly slipping off the edge of the platform. Catching herself, she grabbed the side of the navigator's chair and turned to face the back of the cavernous chamber. When they had come in, the platform had been the first thing their lights had illuminated. It had drawn them to it immediately. Now she saw something else. Many other somethings. Russell, she said quietly. A disquieting feeling came over her, not quite excitement and not quite fear. Look at this. Her light played over a low blanket of mist that hung just below the level of the platform. As she looked, she saw the vapor itself seemed to have some small luminescence of its own. Below it, spread out all around the platform in a recessed area of the chamber floor, were dozens of large pods, each perhaps a foot or 18 inches high. They were oval, somewhat egg-shaped, though there was something almost floral about the tops of the things. Ugly flowers that would never blossom. Never, of course, because they had been here for eons. The mist, Russ began. It's weirdly humid in here, Anne said. Maybe the ship is drawing in moisture from the outside and holding it in this chamber. What are they, Annie? He asked, staring at the pods. More cargo? Anne shone her light around and studied the chamber. A cargo space. It might have been, she supposed. She set her gear on the platform and moved down toward the objects. Should we bring one back? She asked, pushing off from the edge of the platform and sliding down below the upper edge of the fog. The pods appeared to have a leathery texture, yet they still reminded Anne of flowers yet to bloom. She frowned as she dropped to one knee and studied the nearest one. Are they... pulsing? Russ asked from behind her. I think so, Anne replied. A smile spread across her lips. It was impossible for them to be pulsing, of course, because that suggested that life remained in these pods, whatever they were. Centuries or millennia after the ship had crashed, and the bloody battle that had killed so many on board, these strangely cool hothouse mists seemed to have kept these pods in some kind of hibernation state. She reached for the nearest one, her fingers hovering only a foot away. Wait, Russ said. We don't know what they are. Anne turned to smile at him. If the surface is toxic, it won't get through my gloves. Let's just set up the camera, take some images, and Simpson can worry about them, Russ urged. Now where's your sense of adventure? She asked. She saw her husband's eyes widen at the same time as he heard a wet, sticky, peeling noise from behind her. Russ grabbed her arm and hauled her toward him. Get back, he snapped. 
Anne lost her balance and slumped against the edge of the platform. Beyond Russ, she saw the pod opening, strings of mucus hanging from the four petal-like flaps as it split apart. Something shifted and jerked inside the object. Russell, she said, suddenly afraid. It's all right, he told her, glancing over at the pod. The thing within launched itself at him, latched onto his face, and he tried to scream. The sound became a horrible gagging as he stumbled back into her. Anne cried out his name as she shoved and dragged and urged him up onto the platform. Only there did she see the back of the hideous spider thing that had attached itself to him. It's all right, he had said, but it was not all right, nor would it ever be all right ever again. River of Pain makes some interesting suggestions about the occurrences within the derelict discovered by the Jordans. These colonists came upon to view the aftermath of what appeared to be a last stand between xenomorphs, including a queen, and what apparently appears to be the engineers. This of course raises some questions about the timing of this particular event. Is it possible that Kane, Dallas, and Lambert simply didn't come across the same area as the Jordans? Such a massive ship could, and does, hold many secrets within. This would at least explain all of the eggs within the ship's cargo, with the presence of an alien queen. And could this glimpse, seen by the Jordans, somehow be related to the events taking place after Alien Covenant? As we learned in Alien Advent, David was apparently working on a queen to perfect the alien life cycle. Could this queen have been aboard the derelict all this time? What do you think? Comment below and share your opinion. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching this video. I really, really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like. And you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from Alien Theory. A very, very special thanks goes out to Wayland yutani executive, Emmy Uric, part of the Patreon Hive. Emmy Uric, I really appreciate your contributions to the channel, your words of encouragement, and your belief in me. I really sincerely appreciate it, and thank you once more. Everyone who's contributed to the Patreon, I really sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you to the warriors that we have in the Patreon Hive. And I'm happy to announce we also have a new queen. Lady Anne is the first queen of the Alien Theory Patreon Hive. So congratulations, Lady Anne. I appreciate very much your contributions and your support of the channel as well. Thank you very much. If you would like to support the channel and join the Hive as well, you can check out the Patreon page in my links for more information. And in the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. You can follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.